Hello, in this episode we discuss the workup and treatment for conditions associated with gradual visual loss. The first question is what are the differential diagnoses for conditions with chronic or gradual visual impairment? As you can see the list here, refractive error, cataract, open angle glaucoma, age-related macular degeneration, retinitis pigmentosa, diabetic retinopathy, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, also known as pseudotumor cerebri. And finally, we have a couple of conditions that happens in um, developing countries that we will discuss later. Now, before beginning going through the list, just remember that optic neuritis can be associated with acute or chronic visual impairment. We will distinguish between subtypes of optic neuropathy versus optic neuritis in a separate episode. Beginning with refractive errors, what are the three subtypes? We have either myopia, which is nearsightedness, or hyperopia, and astigmatism. Astigmatism is due to what? Due to abnormal corneal shape. Now, what is the treatment recommended for a refractive error? Either glasses or contact lens or surgical correction. Next condition is cataract. What are the risk factors of cataract? Always remember, in addition to diabetes, we have other risk factors such as hypertension, advanced age, radiation exposure, chronic sunlight exposure, and even corticosteroid use. It's an important condition to keep in mind. What are the findings associated with cataract? Remember, decreased visual acuity, impaired night vision and presence of glares during daytime. What physical exam findings hint in favor of cataract? Impaired red reflex, decreased visualization of retinal vessels. When surgical management is recommended for treatment of cataract, lens removal and replacement is only indicated if cataract interferes with activities of daily living. Now, we would discuss glaucoma, both um, acute and uh, chronic, or acute angle closure versus open angle glaucoma in the dedicated episode. But here, we want to just quickly review the findings associated with open angle glaucoma. What are the risk factors? Age older than 40, diabetes, myopia, especially high myopias, and also epidemiologically, it is seen more prevalently among African Americans. When should we suspect the possibility of the diagnosis and thus perform the workup? Any patient older than 35 years who complains of impaired dark adaptation or requires frequent glass changes. What findings are hinting in favor of glaucoma in physical exam? On ophthalmoscopic evaluation, we have copying while pupil size is usually normal, contrary to acute type. What other test is mandatory for such patients? Visual field testing is required and it shows what? It shows loss of peripheral vision. Always remember the most important differential diagnosis of chronic loss of peripheral vision, also referred to as tunnel vision, is chronic or open angle glaucoma. So again, after ophthalmoscopic evaluation, what are the evaluations needed in patients with symptoms of open angle glaucoma? In addition to visual field testing, we need to perform tonometry, as is always the case for glaucoma patients. What is the target of treatment for open angle glaucoma? Remember, in open angle glaucoma, we want to manipulate the production of aqueous humor, not necessarily manipulating the pupillary muscles. So what are the treatment options? First line treatment is topical prostaglandins. The alternative could be trabeculoplasty. If these managements fail, we consider trabeculectomy. What are the second line treatment or management options for open angle glaucoma? Beta 2 blockers such as betoxylol or carbonic anhydrase inhibitor such as acetazolamide. Even though all these treatments focus on reducing aqueous humor production, we may also benefit from pilocarpin, pilocarpin, to, pilocarpin to increase outflow. 
Next on our differential list is age-related macular degeneration. Describe the epidemiologic risk for ARMD. It's usually seen among white women or smoker patients, especially with positive family history. What are the clinical findings? Always remember two things. One is painless loss of central vision and the other is distortion of straight lines. Now, this distortion of straight line could be seen in a couple other conditions as well, but if you see it in a white female smoker, especially if central vision is impaired, first think of ARMD. Now, what are the two types? Uh, we have the dry or atrophic type, which is the most common type and is associated with gradual loss of vision, or we have the exudative, also neovascularized or wet type that is more rapidly progressive. Based on these subtypes, what are the differences on fundoscopy between the dry and wet type? In the dry type, we have pigment changes and drusen. The drusen are these white, yellow, points that could be visualized on fundoscopy, there are accumulations of extracellular material. To remember, I recommend remembering it's Dryzen, so that it happens on the dry type. What are the findings on the neovascularized type? In fundoscopy, they show hemorrhage and subretinal fluid with or without drusen. What's the treatment recommendation for the atrophic type? It's said that we do not have a good treatment currently for the atrophic type ARMD. However, vitamins such as A, C, E, as well as zinc could slow down the progression. What precautions to be considered when administering vitamin A, especially? For both vitamin A and vitamin E, we should avoid high dose administration, especially in smokers, because that has been shown to associate with poor prognosis of lung cancer among smokers. What about the treatment of exudative type? The neovascularized type logical benefits from inhibitors of vascular endothelial growth factor. Can you name examples of them? Bevacizumab and Ranibizumab are the examples. We also have a newer drug called Pegaptinib and if desired we can use photodynamic therapies such as laser photocoagulation together with VEGF inhibitors. Now, which one of the three drugs I mentioned could slow the visual loss in the exudative for pegaptinib? The other two, uh, ranibizumab and bevacizumab, mainly improve the vision. Okay, moving to retinitis pigmentosa. What are the clinical findings? Always include retinitis pigmentosa after open angle chronic glaucoma as a differential diagnosis of chronic peripheral visual loss. Now, if you are specifically set to deal with a patient with mid peripheral visual loss that highly favors retinitis pigmentosa. The other findings include decreased visual acuity in the late course of the disease and bilateral night blindness. Uh, the disease is a progressive disease. What's the pathogenesis? Uh, it's usually associated with a genetic mutation causing uh, progressive retinal degeneration in the course of around 10 years in adults. What do you expect to see in the ophthalmoscopy of retinitis pigmentosa? Uh, the non-specific optic disc pallor, but very important finding is presence of bone and spicule-like aggregates indicating this process of abnormal retinal pigmentation. Unfortunately, most patients uh, would be legally blind by age 40. However, there are experimental and new treatments being under the research. Next, let's move to diabetic retinopathy. Before discussing anything, I want to draw your attention to a term in ophthalmoscopic assessment of diabetic retinopathy, which is the warning sign or finding. What is it? The term is macular edema. Presence of macular edema is associated with impaired vision. Now, what's the epidemiologic significance of diabetic retinopathy? 
it's the most common cause of new blindness among adults worldwide with 95 million cases. What's the association with type of diabetes? 90% of diabetes type 1 and 60% of patients with type 2 diabetes after 20 years of their diabetes have some degree of diabetic retinopathy. What are the important stages of diabetic retinopathy that we need to take into consideration? We have the simple step, pre-proliferative, proliferative, and finally the macular edema step. So what findings hint in favor of simple diabetic retinopathy? Presence of micro microaneurysm and hemorrhage, presence of exudate that's defined as hard exudate and retinal edema again retinal edema is not yet macular edema the macula itself is not yet in, involved with the process of edema so it is just simple what about the pre-proliferative stage uh, in this stage we had that famous cotton wool spots on ophthalmoscopy how about the proliferative stage diabetic retinopathy not only we have the previous changes, now we have new vascularization and vitreous hemorrhage. Don't confuse these new vascularizations and vitreous hemorrhage with the vascular findings on the simple stage, which was microaneurysms and hemorrhage and presence of exudates and retinal edema. Next step was cotton wool spots. Next step is proliferative zoological, it is new vascularization and vitreous hemorrhage v for v new vascularization and vitreous hemorrhage the final stage associated with visual impairment was as i said macular edema when do we know clinically that we are dealing with this stage any of the findings could be possible but as long as the patient complains clinically of decreased visual acuity regardless of ophthalmoscopic findings we are dealing with the macular edema to prevent this condition, what is the screening recommendation for type 1 versus type 2 diabetics? Any newly diagnosed type 2 diabetic patient should be immediately evaluated by an ophthalmologist after the diagnosis. Immediately for type 2, within 5 years of diagnosis of type 1 diabetes, we begin screening. Now, what is the overall management for prevention? We manage by blood glucose measurement and control, lipid control and blood pressure optimization. These measurements could be considered primary or secondary prevention measures. Now, what are the treatments recommended for proliferative and macular edema stage? Remember, intravitreal vascular and arterial growth factor inhibitors, such as the ones we mentioned, bevacizumab and ranibizumab. Once more, for what stages we recommend them? For the proliferative type, remember the findings, the V and V, new vascularization and vitreous hemorrhage, the proliferative type, which is also referred to as the malignant type, or for the stage in which the patient complains of decreased visual acuity indicating macular edema. In these conditions, we use intravitreous VEGF inhibitors. What's the alternative? Again, uh, here we have laser photocoagulation. Now, what is the treatment if vitreal hemorrhage persists despite use of VEGF inhibitors? We consider vitrectomy. Now let's move to idiopathic intracranial hypertension or pseudotumor cerebri. For case identification, what are the epidemiologic and risk factors? We are usually dealing with an obese female younger than 50 years who has taken some sort of medication, most possibly including what medications? Retinoids, tetracycline, growth hormones, and OCPs. What are the findings? As the name indicates, the findings resemble the findings of brain tumor and ICP elevation, including headache, visual symptoms such as either visual loss or increased blind spot or blurred vision and diplopia. And a very important finding or complaint is tinnitus that's defined by patient to be pulsatile. The patient says it sounds like something like what do you expect to see in a thermoscopic exam? Papilledema.
and other findings of ICP elevation. Likewise, what are the findings on the workup? First, we perform neuroimaging. Always remember, MRI is preferred over CT and specifically MRV, magnetic resonance venography, is the preferred modality. Then we perform LP. Now, why should imaging precede LP? We need to make sure any secondary cause of increased ICP, including mass or hemorrhage or cerebral venous thrombosis, cerebral vein thrombosis are ruled out first and then we can perform LP. Put it simple, the first test is MRI, preferably MRV, and the best test, the confirmatory test, is LP. What are the findings in LP? Everything is normal except opening pressure that's elevated. What is elevated opening pressure? An opening pressure greater than 25 centimeter of water. Now, what is the treatment? Treatment begins with weight loss. Then we use acetazolamide. If these don't work, we use ventricular peritoneal shunting. Now, I want to end this episode by discussing a leading cause of blindness in some developing countries, which is referred to as onchocerciasis or river blindness, mediated by a tissue nematode called Onchocerca volvulus. What areas of the world show widespread disease? Sub-Saharan and West Africa, such as Nigeria and Congo, more commonly than Latin America and Southwestern Arabian Peninsula. How is it transmitted? The bite of black fly transmits the larva with adult worms could be present in both skin nodules or in the eye. They may even cross the eye while migrating. Now, what's the second arm of visual impairment? An immune response to microfilaria of the worm in cornea also mediates part of this cordial opacity and damage. So what are the clinical findings? Patient has excoriation and skin nodule containing the worm. The nodules are severely itchy. The eye symptom is that of conjunctivitis progressing to blindness. Now, what are the findings in the eyes of the physical exam? That of keratitis and corneal opacity, again, because of microfilaria migrating to eye, causing direct damage as well as immune response. How is it diagnosed? It's initially a clinical diagnosis that could be backed by eosinophilia and serology. What are the confirmatory steps for the diagnosis? Uh, we can visualize the microfilaria or adult worm in skin nodules, or we can visualize them by the aid of slit lamp on the anterior chamber and cornea. What's alternative to diagnosis? It's Mazzotti test. What is it? It's either an oral dose or a skin patch of diethylcarbamazin that quickly kills the microfilarial form in the skin nodule and causes severe itchiness. What's the treatment? Ivermectin requires very long-term treatment. And with that, we finish this episode.